Well, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Stocks to Buy Live episode two. In this episode, we're going to be diving down into some portfolio updates. We're going to be talking about buying some Toronto real estate. We're going to be answering some of your Q&As, taking a look at the individual positions and actually what's just been generally going on in this wild market. It's been one heck of a ride, but I labeled this a decade of investing. And I wanted to state something that I noticed a lot of young people uh, struggle with um, intensely because it's something that comes up on like Dave Ramsey, some of these investing channels I watch a lot. Uh, and I always find that if you want to find like real success in investing, I find there's this decade that you have to surpass of just utter frugality. It's what I call the prison sentence of life. You have to live like you literally went to jail and pretty much save as much money as humanly possible. This was a decision I made around 22, 23 years old after paying off $23,000 uh, in debt. I used to start a business. And when I came to the conclusion of being able to own companies rather than just work and just pass my money off to someone else to build income and have that extra stream, it kind of perpetuated this idea of, okay, like life is expensive. Let's see what we can do for the last 10 years. Well, I've only really been investing for about eight and a half going on nine, but I've been living between parents' basements. I've never owned a new car. And I've basically given up every single luxury outside of a half decent laptop and maybe a couple LED lights and paying for the internet, of course, which I just had to get another internet package for some of the real estate stuff we're doing. I got a good deal on that at least. But nonetheless, folks, uh, I think this is just what it takes to get to this level of comfort. And I just don't think people are willing to sacrifice enough uh, to do what it takes. And uh, I want to show you the portfolio here. We're going to get into some of the individual details because obviously the portfolio is shrinking uh, dramatically um, from coming up with the deposit on my half along with my uh, better half's side of the portfolio, which I'll give some insight on the stock she holds as well. I appreciate it was always Jason uh, hopping in here, your uh, OG who's crushing it probably long, but well beyond me. Uh, but nonetheless, guys, uh, the portfolio has actually been outperforming this week and we've actually finished the week higher uh, because of the lack of exposure to tech, the broad exposure to VOO. As mentioned, I think the lower half of the S&P 500 is going to start to rise. My Canadian banks have continued to rise into the end of the week, uh, which we'll take a look at the position since I purchased them. Uh, SCHD has been rallying back nicely, and I'm pretty much green on every position in my account at this point. Uh, that's because <laughs> oh, wages are shit uh, and taxes are high. I, I beg to differ, but we'll get into some of that in a moment here. Um, my wage sucked. I think I made about 40 or 50,000 probably up to the last two years. And then only in the last couple of years have I been making like a substantial amount of income, probably in the six figure range. But nonetheless, none of that. Well, actually, I don't think that's a good uh, abbreviation because if you've been investing, even if you've made 40 grand and you're living frugally and you could just save that little bit on these days and these months and these years where the stock rallies aggressively, I mean, I never concluded that as part of my income. Uh, but that is where you start building that wealth. And it's giving yourself a raise, right? We always talk about if you just buy a dividend stock or a good growth company or index funds and they go up 10 or 20 percent. I mean, that's technically a healthy little uh, balance to giving yourself a self-raise and not relying on a company, right? But I just want to kind of get into the positions here um, nonetheless, and we'll take a look at the Canadian positions first and foremost. And I don't like saying and gloating about this just because I don't trust these in the short term. Uh, obviously, there's still a lot of headwinds in most of the financial uh, sector. My long-term thesis still remains that these companies, these banks that are hitting record revenues, after they're dealing with loan loss provisions, after we shake out these, these weaker loans, after they deal with some of the regulatory front that's going to come into the, the lower grade of uh, mortgage quality and credit quality due to the higher interest payments. I think that these banks have been trading at wicked values. And we mentioned that TD, and I've said this a few times, that if I had to pick one bank, TD was probably the cheapest valued. So I upper weighted the two biggest banks in Canada, um, Royal Bank and TD. And sure enough, TD has been the best performer because it was unjustly hit, obviously, by the, um, the regional banks that it was trying to purchase in the US, which would have made it one of the 10 largest banks, I think, in the US, which was what, uh, First Horizon or something like that. But nonetheless, these bank positions have done exceptionally well since I've done some readjustments here. Again, I don't trust them in the short term. I still think there could be some volatility, but hey, it's it's nice seeing a little bit of green here. Not gloating as much as if I just bought these tech companies over the last three or four months. But my S&P 500 position, as always, this is a base to the portfolio. Uh, you know, this is going to be a, a remainder of a large section of the portfolio that's doing pretty well since I've been cost averaging into it. This is part of my corporate uh, account. It's up 11.16%. I'm trying to avoid too many dividend stocks uh, in my corporate account just so I don't have to deal with the passive income tax. I'll have to pay out this. For those of you that don't know, in a corporation, you have to pay 50% tax on passive income. You lose half of it unless you pay it out as an employee, which sure, fine, but I'd rather focus on growth. And I'll probably buy Tesla and some of these other companies back in here at some point, which is still debatable if you ask Jason uh, with the volatility of my ADHD brain, but we'll see where we end up as the, uh, 
as the time uh, kind of comes to pass here. Finally, SCHD guys, these dividend stocks have been coming back with a vengeance and I can't help but recognize that's where the value is at. I, I made a statement in my video yesterday that I think dividend stocks are going to be the outperformer for the latter half of the year. And uh, that could be bold. That could be wrong. I'm gambling. I'm a clown. Don't take that as financial advice. But you can't help but recognize there's so many dividend stocks trading at like five-year lows that are just paying wickedly high yields that most of them can afford. And SCHD holds so many of these wonderful stocks like Verizon, right? Like we talked about Verizon. There's a lot of hate around those things. And I mean, Verizon's payout's so low and they're, I think, getting into the 7% yield range. And, you know, SCHD really comprises a lot of these companies, some of the regional banks as well, which I know are largely hated still amongst the big investors out there. But I'm always looking at that long term. And if a lot of that's been priced into the company, I just think you can only get so oversold in the basket of some of these. Again, the lower half of the S&P is trading, I think, at a PE of between 15 and 17. Uh, I'd have to run the math on it at this point. But when I was watching that about a month ago, everyone's like, yeah, it's if it wasn't for these tech companies, we actually wouldn't have an overvalued, uh, you know, S&P index. And eventually, if money continues to trickle into the market, eventually it's going to start going down there rather into the upper half. And it should continue to balance out, uh, hopefully removing some of the volatility, maybe taking us to all time high. But putting that aside, uh, something that I've talked more about on the patron side of it, I'm not going to talk about position weightings, but here's a, a combo of some, not all, because I don't include all of my fiance's investments. But when I talk about us holding tech stocks, I mentioned when I did my mass pivot in 2020 to buy uh, more of the index funds that I kind of got rid of most of my tech just because my fiance held a larger position in things like Meta, Apple, which also upper weight uh, those positions in our VOO indexes that we both hold combined. And this just kind of gives you some clerical view of kind of where we're sitting with those positions. Uh, but again, I'm not really giving like full insight on this. Maybe if she gets more comfortable, I'll talk about more of that on the patron side of it. But I think it's relevant that, you know, one of the biggest decisions you'll ever make in your life is who you marry financially. And I'm lucky that I've met somebody that, you know, is comfortable going on dates to Costco's $1.50 hot dog and, and drink. And like, we always just go to cheap movie nights or whatever. Like we've been both excessively on the same page when it comes to kind of building our financial life, which has pivoted us into some new directions uh, as we sit in the current market environment. But combined, our portfolio is largely U.S. companies. Companies. And as a Canadian, I always kind of just reiterate that you're better off owning U.S. companies. And I try and always hold them in the native currency of U.S. dollar. So that way I don't have to deal with currency conversions and things like that. And we get the benefit of, you know, obviously the returns that we've experienced over the last decade have been uh, needlessly absurd, especially considering my fiance bought a large amount of her positions in the middle of the pandemic, literally the third week of March pretty much at the bottom of the market. So she, even though the stocks have dropped so dramatically for her, like she's still green on most of them. So she can pat herself on the back for doing that decision. But let's pivot a little bit into the real estate side of things. As mentioned, uh, I'm saving most of this. I'm not getting into hardly any of it. Uh, on this channel, it's going to be reserved for the patron members mostly um, for the time being. So if you want to talk more about interest rates and financing and all that stuff, uh, you can come join the Patreon. The link is down in the description below. You can also join our chat group. So I'm going to give you this insight into the uh, probably the best time. I think that this was I'm going to pat myself on the back for this. I'm hoping in the next couple of years. But during this period where we've had this large sum of capital between us and looking at the real estate market, I was like, if there's ever a time to buy. Yes, I know it doesn't seem logical when the interest rates are up and people have been expecting the market to crash. But when volume has dropped off the way it had, I was like, let's just go take a look. And one thing led to another. And uh, this is kind of what we're working on here. And I'll give you some quick uh, a view of what we managed to pick up in Toronto, which goes well beyond uh, the typical pricing because we did uh, shop around for quite <laughs> some time uh, before we stumbled into this place here, which is kind of neat, uh, working on 1,300 square feet in the city of Toronto, which is kind of mind boggling as, uh, you know, Toronto right now is getting out of control with the rent. Uh, rent is just something I'm so glad I dodged because I was fully ready to rent and just keep my portfolio as is but as dave ramsey and a lot of these financial gurus i follow say you want to own right like and if you can't own here and i just recommend if you haven't had that time to put your 10 years of prison sentence in to build up some capital like you need to just leave this province but we're extremely blessed uh to have been working on something uh, like you're seeing here and again i will probably offer a few more updates on the youtube channel as things evolve here but we're still finishing some stuff up which next week i will be updating the patron members but i figured i would show you that it is more than plausible for people to still buy real estate um if you're working with larger down payments if you're willing to buy older buildings and avoid newer buildings uh newer buildings they expect like over a thousand a square foot they want you to buy parking for sixty thousand dollars forget all of that 
uh, go older buildings. I wouldn't go much older than we went, which is about a 30 year old building, but completely redone. It's a beautiful place and a well kept building. We had a lawyer review HOA and all that stuff. So we're pretty happy. And we'll talk about some of those numbers as time goes on. But I should point out, um, I, I can't stop seeing these TikToks. Um, and it's kind of mind boggling at um, how many people are just starting. I, the immigration is nuts here, first of all, but I'm surprised that not, not more people are just leaving. Um, because I was watching a guy from Dubai that came here and his like his rent went through the roof. Groceries for his family have gone up dramatically. And he just said, forget it. And he said it's cheaper to live in Dubai. And he just went back, which is just kind of staggering to consider. But I've been seeing articles like this, right? Or these little TikToks. The average rent for a one bedroom apartment in Toronto has surpassed $2,000. And it's more than 3000 for a two bedroom. With rent so high, you may wonder if a landlord can charge you additional costs for things like parking, air conditioning, or a storage locker. Pat Foran has this consumer. Yeah, so these people ended up getting a bill that they weren't deserved because it wasn't part of the actual like rental agreement. Um, but they do offer some anecdotes. To the here. building to say the new charges were not allowed under the Residential Tenancies Act. According to my MPP, the charges for the locker room and the charges for the bicycles are illegal. <laughs> because they were provided when the tenants moved in. Landlord the building crazy. management then sent a new notice to residents, which said, due to an error of understanding the rules of amenities, we will not charge <laughs> the tenants for storage lockers Rent and the bike screwed. rack. We get um, notifications like this all the time. They're just normally not so open and brazen in terms of their illegality. Tenant advocate Jordy Dent says charges for services like parking, storage lockers, and introduce new charges unless the tenant agrees. To yeah, there's so much legality going on because there's a lot of like swindling of of like because uh, technically if you're in an older building and not a new build, they're they're rental controlled, so you can't actually raise the rent dramatically. And it kind of leads into this position where these landlords understand like they can get so much out of this market that they'd rather kick tenants out. So they kind of break rules and laws and say, oh, we're going to have family moving in. It's time for you to leave. And then as soon as they get them out, they get new tenants at market value. And the worst thing is you have to bid on properties. I was watching a lady in Toronto that got, had to move out of one uh, apartment and she had to bid to get another apartment. So it's not like a bidding war on, on a like real estate anymore you also have to bid to even get a rental place and these are some of the things that i'm just like so damn thankful we've been able to dodge uh you know pulling the plug when we did on just saying you know now's the time to uh you know just own something and luckily our rent or our total mortgage cost of housing is less than it would be to rent a basement apartment at this point um so i like i said it's just crazy what's going on in ontario and i think it's going to progressively get worse and we're going to see some of that go on i'll show you some of the stuff that's going on politically i try to avoid the political conversation but firstly i found this comment very intriguing because i don't think people actually understand uh, you know, investment properties. I made a video talking about, you know, Dave Ramsey and just quoting that, like, it's better to just own investment property because I'm not a guy that likes utilizing the banks. My bank advisors are great, but nonetheless, I hate debt. I hate using mortgages. I hate banks. I hate everything to do with having to answer to somebody. You know, it's just my personal opinion. If you love using debt, you like the risk by all means, but it's just my personal opinion. This guy says, if you uh, buy an investment property with cash, the largest beneficiary is the government uh, because you are paying taxes at the highest rate and not using the largest deductions. And when I hear like the largest deductions, that's paying a mortgage. Yeah, you're not going to pay tax on a mortgage because it's it's a loss. So instead of just paying the government a bit of tax, you're just going to lose it to the, the, the bank. Let them make the money. Spend 500K on a condo making 3K a month in rent. Subtract expenses you might bring in 2,000. 2500 perhaps and government uh, taking half of that. I don't know where you think the government's taking half of that. So you might end up making 1200 a month after tax topped, which is 3% or so, probably much less. The vast majority of time, um, you know, Ramsey doesn't know what he's talking about, which I beg to differ. I don't understand. You can, if you, you can even buy investment properties in a corporation and you get so many tax deductions, you're probably only paying 13% up to the first half a million of income, first and foremost. You know, capital gains, a lot of that stuff comes into play later down the road, but you're, there's no way you're paying 50%. Are you in California? You know, bracketed here in Canada, unless you're making six figures, I highly doubt you're even getting close to paying 50% tax on uh, rental income. And then the whole time you have a capital appreciation in the building, right? So if it appreciates over time, you know, you can raise rents if you're not in a landlocked position then or a rental lock, then you're, you're good. I mean, there's just there's huge money in rental. I mean, God, if you've, if you've learned anything about the last five years in Canada, you made a small fortune if you bought in Ontario or Vancouver, if you were so lucky to even have the fortitude to, to 
afford that kind of real estate, which we don't. I just want to get my living circumstances under control. Forget trying to get into rentals until you can figure out how to live affordably in this kind of market, right? And this has led to a lot of uprising now in Canada. No different to the pandemic when we kind of did some silly stuff and our government went a little insane. Uh, you know, Trudeau is, uh, again, I'm not trying to be political here, but there's just been so much hate uh, and so much just frustration uh, as people just can't afford to live like they used to. This is Belleville. There's like people trying to be like, oh, we love you, Trudeau. And then like the other half of the crowd is like, have you? <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> I've honestly stated that, like, when it comes to politics, they, they aren't going to help you by any metric. And when it comes to these interest rates and inflation, it's so backwards because the Treasury can only raise or lower interest rates. And the government has so much policy control over inflation that they just don't take advantage of it. Again, like carbon tax has been eating into so much of the inflationary costs. I know people think, oh, it can't be that bad, but it's an extra like eight or nine hundred dollars a year in a total household. And again, that just drives up food, all that other stuff. I'm not like, like I said, carbon tax in a country like Canada, where we're probably one of the least polluting countries on the planet. I get, you know, we want to make an example. But nonetheless, I just it, it's kind of backwards <laughs> policy versus Treasury or the Federal Reserve in the U.S. versus like the government having control over that. You know, I like what uh, Warren Buffett said about if you want to get like everything under control in government, especially when it comes to like the, the like the U.S. debt or the Canadian debt is you just make a policy that if you're in if you come into term and and you get elected and during your elected period that you know the the national debt goes up then you can't sign up for re-election next year and he says if he incentivize them to stop doing it in spending i mean there's a lot of good investments off that right like in the us there's infrastructure investments i know um i think it was steve eisman saying that he's investing in infrastructure-based companies because they have tens of billions of dollars they're allocating over the next decade to infrastructure that are going to directly benefit you know, a lot of infrastructure building, I'm sure. So there, you know, there's companies that are going to benefit substantially from that, um, which can be a little bit of an arbitrage play, I guess. Government overspending doesn't matter. Eventually, it hurts everyone. Well, it's hurting everybody right now, right? I mean, our government policies in Canada, especially, uh, again, it's a double-edged sword. Immigration, it pumps the economy up, but at the same time, we don't have the infrastructure to support it. So we see an overvaluation in housing, a bubble. The bubble is going to persist for as long as we have this d direct, uncontrolled supply and demand metric. I mean, all of this is driven by government policy, right? And it's hard to say, hey, we're going to halt immigration. Hey, we're going to halt carbon tax. We're going to, and then they just try and anecdote it by saying, oh, we're going to increase the child benefit and this and that, and just give you little mild benefits here and there. Meanwhile, you're getting wrecked on everything else, right? And I'm not a politician. I don't know what fixes that. I don't even want to get involved with it. I just take my own circumstance. I will vote. I won't get into who I vote for. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I always try and leave the government out of any investment decision, any personal. Like, honestly, if it was too expensive here for us, I would just go to Alberta. I would just bite the bullet and just do whatever made sense for us in the current situation. And that's what people got to do. You, you shouldn't base it off uh, political stuff. It could come to a point of, you know, political unrest. I don't know if we'll get to that point. It feels like it when you look at some of these rallies. But to be honest, I just dig my hand in the sand. It's probably not the best thing to do, but I hate the divisiveness of it all. It's kind of like in the U.S. with the, the right and the left. It's like, can't you just hire the, the two best parties, sit them down in a room? And like, you know, there's the there's an example of um, in, in a mall. This guy took a, a huge thing of jelly beans. There was like several thousand jelly beans in a container. He puts them in the mall and he spends like the next week or two letting people guess how many jelly beans are in the thing to win it. And then they decided that if you take the median of what everybody guessed from the worst guess to the best guess, they were off by like two jelly beans, the median. The, the, like and it's just like it's crazy how intelligent humans can be when we all get together we build rocket ships we go to the moon you know we build ai technology and electric vehicles but when it comes to government it's like we elect one guy that has a few guys behind him and i don't know what the hell goes on with policy beyond that but it should be a little bit more diverse and the decision making when it comes to how bad it affects our lives. Uh, but nonetheless, taking a look at the markets today here, folks, uh, coming into the Friday close, it has been, again, a story of the dividends uh, themselves because tech stocks are finally taking a breath, damn it. And I'm hoping they take a bigger breath. Tesla's down a little bit more today. Palantir, a lot of these uh, stocks that have been obviously overbought. And I, I think people have a hard time. They get caught up in the euphoria. And it's something, again, that I missed out on this rally. I missed the major drops because I decided to diversify into the ETF. ETFs. But the thing is, is what I'm trying to advocate and people in our chat groups that you can join on Patreon, like they, they, they're smart. They get it. They're like, you know, when things are so euphoric, 
I mean, it was just a week ago we were talking about now is the time to start diversifying if your positions are up dramatically. I always said if you can get 100% gain in under a year, it's time to take some profit. It doesn't mean you have to sell the whole position, but it's a good time to diversify if your positions start overweighting by 5 or 10% of your portfolio. And then you don't regret some of these days where, you know, the stocks can drop 10, 20, God knows what the next week or two looks like. And again, some people are more advocated toward just holding long term and just letting a position like Tesla overtake 50% of their portfolio. But honestly, I like what Kevin O'Leary says. If I'm listening to billionaires, they always come down to that fundamental advice of taking profit. Don't worry about taxes. If you're paying taxes, you're doing something right. And just avoid the calamity of what could be an inevitable end to something. Not that Tesla or Apple are ever going to come to an end, but you just don't know, right? And eventually, you know, you could run into a position like the pandemic. That was horrifying. I'm like, do you have the mental fortitude if like Facebook or Meta was like one of your largest positions to ride that from $300 to $90 a share and wipe out like so much of your wealth? Do you really have that kind of fortitude? Because I did not. I definitely did not have for that. So, I mean, I think uh, this was the opportunity and people are probably starting to wake up now. Stop losses are getting triggered. Banks and all these big kedgies chase the market up. They kept resetting their stop losses higher. Now things are going to get triggered. Now they want to lock in some profits to make sure they have something to show at the end of the year uh, because obviously things are uh, they're just expensive. They've been chased. And, you know, that's kind of where we sit. So getting into some of the Q&A's from this week, uh, Lazar says, I wouldn't touch MPW, which is one of the stocks that uh, I love to talk about. It's one that I've been. I haven't really put myself in a position to buy it, but it's been an intriguing place of interest uh, because of some of the lawsuits and some of the uh, the rhetoric with one of their uh, holding companies, I think, or company they, they had some share stake in. The guy was buying boats. Uh, he was spending all the money. Meanwhile, the company or the, 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 the hospitals they had exposure to couldn't keep afloat uh, with the way that it was positioned or something. And the whole thing came collapsing down. They had to buy part of it out. They ended up selling a huge position of one of their other uh, portfolio aspects to Aust some Australian company. Sorry, I'm kind of just uh, verbating something that I think is generally right, but I don't know the exact, uh, the exact details. I haven't looked into it in a while. But this guy says, I wouldn't touch MPW with a 10-foot pole. If you don't know, Medical Properties Trust, obviously a medical REIT. Uh, there's some serious nefarious stuff going on. And I I still beg to differ. I honestly think that this company, uh, they have the wealth. They've, they've got tons of cash. They've, they raised billions of dollars. Uh, and I said when this thing dropped down here that this would be the good time to buy. And if you bought these dips down here, we were talking about this again in the chat groups, guys. It's rallied 40% off the lows. And it's paying back down here. It was paying like a 15 or some ridiculous dividend yield that it's still continuing to pay. And if history has anything to say from the 08 financial crisis, I mean, this thing came out of it pretty good. Uh, again, REITs are debatable just because of the higher interest rate environment. But I think if you dig through some of these, you'll find some crazy value. Now, I'd avoid office. A lot of people like office REITs right now, but I'm horrified by them because like, I was looking at some office stats and people just don't want to go back to office, man. And, and there's just no point for it from an efficiency standpoint, working from home. I know a lot of people, Elon, they all debate that, but they're old dinosaurs and they just don't understand the new economy here. And the new economy is people are fighting going back to work. My fiance works for a university. She fought it down to one day a week. I mean, I've been working from home for the since the pandemic and I've never gone back. I make great money at my job that I got and I appreciate it. I put my hours in, you know, some people might be lazy and can't handle that, but honestly, it's probably one of the best lives you're going to have because it makes life more affordable, less gas. You know, you get the benefit of having actual time with your family. You can have lunch with your family. You know, if something comes up, you can, if you have time, you can do it. And then you find yourself working odd hours. I know people say, oh, I only want to be emailed from nine to five, but it's like, hey, you know, stuff comes up. You know, my fiance, same thing. Like if, if she has time to do something at night just to get caught up, she'll do it. I'll do the same thing if I like go find myself working at 9 p.m. or whatever if I have to, if I didn't do something or I need to catch up, right? Um, someone said, good video. I've been adding my telecom positions at these levels. They'll come back. And the dividends are fantastic while we wait. Uh, in the terms of healthcare, what are your thoughts on CVS? I know Jeremy and a lot of other people, financial education, they love CVS. It's one that I've never particularly got too far into. I'm not the biggest fan um, of retail that much. CVS, more retail stores. Um, I've never dug down into them. I've always been a little horrified by the cyclicality of it. And especially uh, CVS, there's some convoluted mess of like what happens 
you know, I'm pretty sure it's just a drug store, isn't it? It's kind of like Shoppers Drug Mart here. And if people just start ordering pharmaceuticals and their drugs from like Amazon or as online stuff picks up, I don't know. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I'm pretty sure the numbers are pretty fantastic. But he says, agreed, at 7%, you can almost double your yield uh, for SCHD because VYM, or sorry, uh, VZ, uh, Verizon um, and uh, AT&T are paying out huge yields right now. Same on the Canadian side of the border. Um, I think right now the better buying opportunity is with Verizon and probably AT&T over the Canadian counterparts that are only just starting to get the wind of higher interest layoffs. They're kind of laggard to the U.S. correction on that side of it. Um, again, you can debate whatever you want with them, but they're obviously insanely cheaply valued and they're they're primarily huge infrastructure companies to the way society functions. And if you really think your phone bill is just going to disappear overnight, I have a hard time believing Verizon's not going to be around in 20, 30, 50 years. I don't know why I'm waiting, but I will regret not buying uh, Verizon at these levels. 10-year ROE for Verizon is over 30% and it's offering current yields in excess of 7%, which is quite safe. Yeah, I think it's paying, um, I think it pays out 50% of its income right now. Um, um, and again, interest, I'm telling you, all these stocks that are hindered by high interest rates, they're going to come down. People are like, they're going to stay higher for longer. I, I may be another year. There's just no way they're going to leave interest this high. Historically, every time high interest came into play within a year, it always started coming back down. Uh, finally, um, saying seeing uh, some gains on SHD, VYM, DVY, DGRO, FDV, kind of happy, uh, but kind of wanted them to stay lower for longer or down for longer. And uh, honestly, at this point, I'll take it or leave it. I just keep cost averaging. Uh, I still think a lot of them are cheap. I don't think they've come back that much. You probably still have some good opportunity. Uh, SEHD, I know at the, the overall PE, I think trades a, a little bit higher, but compared to the broader market, I still think it's more favorable. And again, honestly, just set the drip up. If you're young, who cares? You think you're going to worry about like this, even a Tesla running 50% this year, whatever, 100%, you really think that's going to matter in 20 or 30 years? There'll be hiccups on a radar of either to the freaking moon or into the ground. Uh, so when you're buying these ETFs, I don't think it matters because uh, these are like my buy and ride or die, hold forever. I'm going to utilize them to pay my bills at some point, probably the next 10 or 20 years. Um, Chess Dad says, a master plan. This is the idea right here, my man. You got it right on point. And my master plan of doing nothing has worked out very well. And that is the fortitude that my fiance has as well. Uh, a decision she made as I was repositioning. She did not. She rode the ride. She rode the wave and she pulled that on the other side much better uh, in a position than I, I probably could have been in a good position if I held all my tech companies. But man, that ride was wild, wasn't it? Uh, it's hard having that fortitude, man. People get lucky, but they don't understand how hard that is to do long term. Uh, exactly. Hold on. <laughs> Vic Gill's got it, too. He's like hard to hold on to your convictions when the market is so freaking crazy. FOMO is really getting uh, really uh, tough to deal with. Uh, yeah, the fear of missing out. I, I have no fear of missing out. I, I kind of get that that feeling once in a while, you know, where you're like, oh, I should just buy it. But the problem is, is even if I bought it and it went up, I would still sell it and take profits because I, I just couldn't accept these crazy gains as quick as they've been happening. But let's get into some of the Q&As. Uh, what do we got going on here, guys? Uh, that's you know, Let's see what we got here. Uh, SEHD owns a 3M and Ford. Um, yeah, but it's it owns 100 stocks, right? And they're based off certain uh, metrics. And I don't think Ford's necessarily the worst buy. Um, honestly, uh, car companies aren't things I'm very fond of owning, but two positions. And 3M is a hard one to wrap your head around if it's actually favorably valued or that one's been beaten into the ground. Let's take a quick look at 3M. Uh, 3M is one of those companies that I know PPCE and recently sold off. And there's a lot of debate because the valuation is so uh, ridiculous at this point. And it does seem to have found a bottom uh, sometime back in October. Uh, it did hit that bottom there and it's been up only 11%. We're not talking. Oh, sorry. That's from June. What am I talking about? October. Jeez, it's been down since October. I keep, I keep thinking like the S&P 500 bottomed in October. It sounds 16% from October. But yeah, I've seen um, everything money talk about this one. I've seen a lot of people talk about it. I don't know if it's the buying opportunity of a lifetime or a continued distressed company with tons of lawsuits. Uh, it's it's up for favorable debate. But you can say the same thing about the S&P 500. I mean, I could pull a dozen companies out of the S&P that are garbage. Uh, that's just the joys of buying uh, index funds and ETFs, right? Great work, Kyle. Um, I like to set, uh, like to set it and forget it, uh, portfolio style. Yeah, I'm, I've been a hard trying to forget, set and forget. That's not something I've done well over the last two years. I've done it good for the last couple of years, but you know, leading into the volatility, my family and I left Toronto and went to a similar city. Best decision we made. Yes. Good for you, sir. Like I said, we could have semi-retired right now if we just moved to Alberta, but, but for us personally, I don't think it's always the cost of living that matters as much as family does. I would sacrifice a lot of my money 
to deal with family. And that is a conclusion that led us to buying in the most expensive, one of the most expensive cities on the freaking planet. But again, we're in the position where we can comfortably follow the 30% rule, which is no more than 30% of our income going toward household expenses, even with the mortgage and HOA utilities, the whole nine yards. We are very on point when it comes to following the fundamentals of buying and affording real estate. Uh, I just moved to Hawaii. That's an expensive place, my man. I had the opportunity, uh, you know, some family friends invited us over. We ended up staying, but they went, um, we didn't even consider it really. Renting a house for $4,800 to buy the same house would cost me 10,000 or what? What do you mean it would cost you 10,000? One sec, let me reread that. Renting a house for 4,800 to buy the same house would cost me 10, I'm presuming you mean 10 million. Maybe the only uh, place where renting is smarter uh, makes 4,800 look like uh, the place is free. Yeah, but it's the same in Canada, right? I mean, the average cost of a house, you're looking at over a million dollars and that's probably not for the best house. You could probably rent that out for like 5,000 or more a month. Um, so, I mean, um, but again, we're not talking about, I would never buy a house here. I, I would, I would move before I'd buy a house. I, if I even, I had five or 10 million, I wouldn't buy a house here. I'm sorry. They're just too expensive at this point. Um, a condo that's comfortable. It's probably as far as I'll go. Uh, government, uh, overspending, uh, does matter. Eventually it hurts everyone. Yes. We kind of abbreviated to some of this, a add some ticker, uh, moat maker. <laughs> uh, let's see here. And TD, uh, shorted silver while, uh, they had a sale in their precious metal website and then silver went up plus, uh, the takeover uh, if the U.S. Uh, bank that failed or uh, sorry, I'm trying to abbreviate that to the best of my ability. Do they short silver? Um, usually the banks might hedge some of the precious metal positions, but I'm not too familiar with that aspect of it. So I would have to uh, dig a little deeper. But I still think, you know, banks are going to do some dumb things. They'll do some smart things. But again, if the bank goes under. I promise you this in Canada, not the US. The US is a very different place. Canada has monopolistic banks that are highly regulated and there's only like five big ones. And it always comes down to the point, if the bank goes under, are you really going to be worried about your money? If we were in a situation where banks start collapsing here in Canada, I promise you the last thing uh, that's going to be even partially worried about is your portfolio or your accounts. Because <laughs> I'm telling you, the economy is going to be, uh, you know, back to the depression. Kyle, uh, what do you think of CNR? I'll bring CNR up. It's probably one of my favorite stocks that I haven't bought yet, but it's on my buy list along with a few others. Uh, and this one is one of those ones that, you know, it, you, you're not, it's always going to be expensive. It's never going to be cheap. Uh, it's one of these ones that, you know, I'll bring up some of the dividend aspects of it. This is a Canadian National Railway. Uh, the other one is a faster grower, but the dividend is a lot more inconsistent. Uh, I'm trying to remember. They changed the name of it. The company ended up converting its name to something else. CNR is probably more of the Canadian dividend favorite. And yeah, these things have moats. The Canadian National Railways, it's like Buffett, you know, the, the consistency and the stability of this. It's part of uh, one of the ETFs that I really like. I think it's the BMO Low Volatility Canadian ETF. It holds CNR. It holds things like Hydro One. Uh, there's also stocks in there like Metro and Loblaws, which I talked about in a video. Uh, if you build a portfolio of some of those foundational companies, like you're, you're going to look at extreme stability um, in your portfolio. I kind of like when it comes, I'll bring it up because I kind of like the BMO uh, low volatility. I just don't like the cost of it. Um, Canadian equity ETF. These are really fun to analyze um, when you guys look at what some of these ETFs are doing. Because uh, you can learn a lot by what these big fund managers that are outperforming. This ETF has had some astounding performance. Is this not? Uh, yeah. So this should be the one here, I think. Yeah. So Hydro One, uh, Metro, Empire, Law of Laws, things like Fortis, Amera, Barrick Gold. Not the biggest fan of Barrick, but I still think some of the gold companies will probably be fairly favorable at some point here if it wasn't for the Canadian wildfires. Uh, Franco, uh, Nevada Corp, West Connection, or uh, Waste Connections is another one that's like the Canadian counterpart of um, waste management in the US. It's very expensive though. Uh, but this company purely bases off uh, volatility. So uh, it's a very uh, fun ETF to follow because uh, even since 2019, a $10,000 investment's worth 13. It's, it gets some pretty stabilized aspects of the portfolio. But again, I think the funds are insanely uh, um, high feed in this one. I'm trying to remember what the expense ratio is. Um, because I think the expense ratio on this guy is somewhere in the upper 0.3%, which is kind of my breaking point for ETFs. I really don't like paying much over 0.2. And then if it gets into the 0.3, 0.4, I'll just replicate part of the portfolio and take the top holdings. Uh, usually the best thing you're going to do, right? Um, so yeah, CNR is great. I don't feel comfortable um, investing in tech stocks right now. Still waiting for interest rates to take a hit. I don't think interest rates are going to hit tech that hard because they have such great balance sheets. This is something we talked about why tech is actually outperformed is because they don't have the same uh, you know, effect or the same hit by interest rates like some of these infrastructure companies and banking uh, will in the short term. Um, but yeah, the second half of this year to see a pullback. Honestly, when it comes to tech, I have 
So I play the tech a little more than most people will. I want to buy Tesla. I'm hoping it pulls back more. Hopefully by then I'll have some cash. But if you want to buy a company like Tesla or Apple, honestly, forget valuation altogether. Honestly, people hate when I say this, but these are the kind of companies that are so foundational at this point that you're better off just cost averaging into them. And just forget, like it's like buying an ETF. You just put aside an allotted amount of capital and you say, hey, look, I'll take five, 10 grand for the next six months. Every month, I'll just start allotting some capital to it. Buy the highs and lows and just take the averages because you're never going to win at trying to time the tech game. Uh, and if this last year hasn't said enough about that, honestly, like this is probably the year where it doesn't make any sense. How has tech gone so high up? But again, it's just there, there's not a lot of companies that have the resilience that they do. And they're going to slow down on revenue. They're going to get hit on some aspects in, the, in the, the short term, which could hopefully hinder stock price. But you don't know. And you're kind of gambling on it, in my opinion. Uh, how Cutie still thinks interest rates are coming down. So naive. Uh, I'm not naive about it. I'm just stating that if history has anything to say about it, which, again, this is the first time ever. Again, if any prior history has anything to say about the future, this is the first time that we haven't seen a massive hit to a reset, like a, a crazy hit to real estate, a crazy hit to the broader economy, the jobs market. This could potentially be the first ever soft landing. But when we're talking about interest rates specifically, like we'll just use the U.S. interest rates as an example. Um, let me just bring it up here. Interest rate uh, chart in the U.S. This is my conclusion to interest rates. Uh, oh, one sec here. What is going on? I almost left the stream. One sec. <laughs> U.S. interest rate chart. Yeah, I don't think you understand that like no government like the only reason rates are this high right now is because of inflation. And they've already stated, even the Canadian Treasury says they want to bring the rates down hopefully by next July. It just depends on if inflation stays down or goes higher. But if you look at the long term history of interest rates in every single circumstance where they raised rates within a couple years, they lowered them, except for the exception of like 1995 to 2000. That was probably like one of the few exceptions where they stayed a lot higher, but and on any like recessionary environment where they were forced to raise rates, you can see they immediately lowered them within two years, going all the way back to like the 1950s. Rates go up, rates come down, rates go up, rates come down. They go up, they come down, they go up, they come down. They go up, they stayed up for a little bit, and then they came down. They went up again, they came down again. They went up, they came down. Now they're up again. What comes after they go up? It comes down again. It's not like I'm trying to be naive about it. I'm just saying that, you know, if history has anything to say about it, I can't presume they're going to. If I had to make a bet, they'll nominalize rates somewhere between three and four percent. They're probably not going to go back to zero, um, but there's no way they're going to leave them at where they're at. People are getting destroyed on them and they know they're getting destroyed. And the Treasury just says, hey, we have a target, two percent inflation. If we can get there and sustain there, we'll bring interest rates down. And the Canadian Treasury just stated that hopefully by next spring, Next summer, that's when they can start tampering. But by then, who knows? Maybe we go into a recession. Maybe the job layoffs finally impact the broader Canadian housing economy. Who the heck actually knows? Time will truly tell. Ever taken uh, a look at uh, uh, PZA? I have. Uh, I think it's a pretty reasonable stock. I've never deep dived recently into it. But yeah, obviously, it's come across. Uh, I think if you're in the Canadian market, uh, let's just take a quick look at it. PZA, the uh, pizza companies. Yeah, these are probably pretty good pizza pizza. You know, look at the, look at the, the 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 comeback on this guy here. I mean, it's paying a six percent yield. Let's just see how sustainable this is. We'll run a quick analysis. It's up one hundred twenty seven percent since uh, twenty twenty one. Uh, it's been one of these companies that you're probably just buying for the dividends. Obviously, everyone loves pizza. It's probably not going anywhere anytime soon. Price to earnings at 17, probably fairly reasonable. Uh, what I just want to see is cash flow. Has the cash flow been sustainable here? Yeah, you know, it's it hasn't been growing, but it's been relatively sustainable. You can kind of see that the annual revenue really reflects the stock price. So there has been a lot of volatility here. I'd like to figure out what caused this. But um, yeah, I like I said, I've never dug deep enough to be like, yeah, this is the one I'm going to buy. From asset to liability standpoint, we're talking 367. I'm presuming this is in the millions and not billions. Yeah. So 360. Is that it? Three, oh, no. Sorry. That's thousands, right? So it's not even that big of a, an asset base. 367 million versus, well, pretty good, actually. 75 million in total liabilities. You know, they're almost sitting on 300 million in assets. And that gives them what's their market cap? 491 million. So you're really not paying too much above net asset values. Uh, you know, with a, a dividend yield, is it sustainable? What's your current payout ratio? You're looking at a payout of 92%, pretty high, but it probably operates like a REIT or a restaurant where they're probably paying out most of the income because let's be real, pizza probably doesn't have that much of a growth factor to it. Um, but yeah, you know, if it tickles your fancy, you want it as a, a decision in your portfolio, that's a thing you can come down to. Um, what's going on? We just got to track the US two year uh, yield. That's what controls the Fed. Yeah, it definitely does. Uh, I understand Canadian stocks. Um, yeah, not much else going on here, <laughs> folks. 38 minutes into this. I hope you kind of been enjoying the new onslaught of streams that I'm trying to keep myself awake for because today I was wrecked from work. I've got so much going on. 
uh, with my personal life um, that uh, it's it's been a shit show, folks. I got to say, this has been one of the most dramatic two years of my life going from job transition to and what ended up working out to being a six figure income. I've lost so many friends. Got to go to a funeral uh, tomorrow. It would have been my, my one of my good friends 40th birthday. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away from cancer um, last November. And we're finally going to start doing uh, just a celebration barbecue. I think his funeral's on Monday. Um, so I mean, that puts some things into perspective. There's a guy I watch. Um, what's his name? He, you guys might know him. He's he talks about Tesla all the time. He just posted that his wife, unfortunately, has breast cancer. And that stuff really kind of, again, it reiterates the idea that money is not everything, which again, why we'd rather live closer to family than focus on just being financially free tomorrow. Uh, because you just don't know how much time you have. So finding that that balance. And when you have these these big family events, I think it really puts things into consideration considering my buddy was 39 years old. Um, so, I mean, he definitely put a lot of things into perspective and I'm glad we got to spend some time together, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it happens. Uh, it's not just me. I'm sure everyone's affected by things. I don't like to pay the, the pity party and hope like this is sad because everybody deals with this. Uh, one of my uh, coworkers uh, that I work with a lot, his father unfortunately passed away from a very similar cancer. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's just something that I think needs to be iterated. If it's not something you've experienced in your life, when you get into your thirties and forties, I think that's the rude wake up call that, you know, your parents get older, they get sick. You know, you have to figure that out financially, but you again, can't always just focus on saying, Oh, I need to be rich. I need to be rent card on. I can only buy real estate and, you know, forget all this crap. It's like, you know, I, it's stuff you really need to take into consideration and realize that time is, is more valuable than, than money itself. Right. I'd give up a lot of money if I could, you know, extend those years, like Buffett says, when you're you're young, you're, you're cash rich, or sorry, when you're young, you're time rich, and when you're old, you're cash rich, but you're time poor, and unfortunately, only live once, folks. So don't, when I talk about that decade of prison sentence, it's it's an unfortunate reality that you just have to go through, and it, it sets the fundamentals in your, your mind to deal with that for the rest of your life, but that, that prison sentence time period of 10 years, you've got to do it when you're younger and not when you're older, when your body's nimble. And you don't have to give up as much as I'm saying, because again, you can find jobs in, in industries that are appealing to you where you can enjoy your work more than you can your living and give up your living circumstance. Because if I showed you where I'm living right now, if I turn, maybe that's what I'll do. Maybe that's what I'll do. Can I turn my uh, can I turn my background off here while I'm doing this on live? Will it let me edit this? Because maybe I can even show you guys. Uh, I don't know if it will. Yeah, maybe it will. Like I can't express to you the the small condensed rooms that I've lived in my whole life and the insanity of never owning like luxury cars that are like brand new. Um, but yeah, I, I literally live in a little bit of a foam densed room and uh, I have no luxuries, man. I still need to make my bed. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I don't think people uh, really want to sacrifice this when they're younger. I think they get this egotistical idea of I need, I need all this fancy, uh, you know, stuff in my life to to feel comfortable. Yeah, F cancer. Hopefully, in our lifetime, it'll be cured. In fact, um, fun little anecdote: a company I'm working with. Uh, maybe I'll share some advice on it because Canada is starting to privatize healthcare, which people can debate on if that's a good or a bad thing. And not Canada itself, but there's companies coming in that are offering paid services. And there's a new company that just uh, I'm working with privately uh, through my work, not through the YouTube channel. And they are taking blood samples to diagnose your genetics to figure out what cancers you're predisposed to. Um, and then that way you can take that information to your doctor and have regular checkups to make sure you, you're obviously you know safe from it. Um, and they have a test. It's really the, the base genetic test is four hundred dollars but the actual cancer test which if you think you have cancer and you don't want to wait for the doctor diagnosis they'll take your blood and they'll directly test your blood uh, for cancer and it's expensive it's like twelve hundred dollars but again if you have you can uh they told me that you can take it to the the government or whatever i don't know how it works through the policies but you can take it and actually get it reimbursed uh through the health care you just can't do it up front you have to get it done and reimbursed later uh god rest their souls um losing loved ones is always hard Yes. Um, you, you, the mental fortitude to it, man. I don't know if it's uh, just something that I've become too abrasive to at this point, but you get used to the death. <laughs> it's a weird fact of life eventually. I grew up on a farm, so surrounded by death and animals my whole life. But when it starts happening with family, you're like, whoa, shit, shit's getting real. Uh, sounds very Elizabeth Holmes, like it's the real. Uh, yeah, this this one isn't as easy as, uh, as Elizabeth Holmes. <laughs> um, this isn't like an instant blood test. I think it takes a week to get the results. You actually go in and take the blood. They send it off. I wish, uh, you know, I wish, I hope it's not that that is Elizabeth Holmes. I'm hoping this shit's not a lie and they're just taking your money. Um, but on that, folks, uh, stay diligent as always. And uh, I'll always look forward to coming back here next week. And uh, talking about stocks, life, and just what's going on in general is my goal to a million-dollar portfolio. Um, 
I'm hoping I got a two year price target here at this point, <laughs> two years between our total asset values and, and we're damn near getting close. Uh, if the market keeps going up and our real estate doesn't crash, we could be there in two years. So we'll see how that journey continues and I'll always update you here while all these YouTubers come and go. But I bless you all and have a wonderful weekend. Uh, stay cool, stay awesome and stay diligent, folks. Keep investing. Peace.